Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to my Sunday Miscellany video. Uh, for those who are new to the channel, this is a weekly feature of my channel where I talk about the books that I've read during the week and the music that I've listened to and the movies that I've watched. And I usually start out with the music and I always leave a playlist of the highlights from the music that I've listened to and uh, this week was a good uh, music week. I listened to Mozart's 24th Piano Concerto in C minor which is quite different as far as Mozart's music tends to go. Uh, Mozart is known for being a kind of cheerful, happy, light composer, but this this concerto is much more brooding and dark, and I really like brooding and dark classical music, so there's going to be a track from that in there. I also listened to uh, Robert Schumann's Piano Concerto in A minor, which is not exactly dark and brooding, but is much more sort of meditative, and uh, it, it is lovely, so some pieces from that as well, or one piece from that. And then finally, uh, Beethoven's Violin Concerto in D major, which I also listened to, and which is also uh, quite meditative, quite meditative and quite lovely. I will leave one track from that, uh, the, the second movement. There's three movements. I'm leaving the middle movement, uh, the slow movement. It's also, also the shortest movement. I think it's just beautiful, so there's going to be that there. And then uh, I also listened to some non-classical music this week, and of those, uh, the highlights are My Head is an Animal by Of Monsters and Men, who are uh, an Icelandic band, uh, and this is one of my favorite albums, I, it's, so it's a re-listen, I listen to this many times, and I, it's an album I tend to listen to when I get into a sentimental mood, and I was in a sentimental mood this week for personal reasons, uh, and then I also listened to uh, an album by Low Roar, who is a musician who also is from Iceland, incidentally, and whose album I also listen to when I get into a sentimental mood, so I will leave some tracks from that as well. And then I finally listened to one new album, which is Race by Alex G, who is kind of a lo-fi singer. I think that's what the genre is called. Uh, so his music's very minimalist, not all that much fireworks, a lot of, you know, acoustic guitar and drums and that sort of thing. Uh, and his, his music is really good. I, I've listened to some of his song, individual songs on YouTube before, but never to an entire album. And I, I really liked this one. His music has kind of almost a naive sound to it. You know, it almost sounds like childish in a way, or adolescent, but it has a lot of, I think, emotional depth to it, so, uh, and they're, uh, they also sound very, very catchy, and it's, it's funny, he's one of those musicians where the songs he makes sound happy, but when you listen to the lyrics, they're actually quite dark and depressing, so, and I tend to like music like that, so, so there'll be some songs from that album there. And then uh, I move into the books. I don't have too much book talk today because the two books that I, uh, well, one that I still need to finish, one that I already finished, uh, the, uh, both of them are books where I want to make videos on both of them. So I won't talk about them too much here. The first one is As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner, which I finished yesterday. And it was my first Faulkner and I thought it was extremely interesting. I have a lot of thoughts about it, none of them very coherent, but I made a lot of connections between this book and a lot of past literature that I've read, and I had a lot of ideas about what it was saying, and I would like to talk about those in a video unto itself. So I will do that. I've, I've said a lot in these miscell miscellany videos that I'll make a video about XYZ and haven't done it. I will do this. I will make a video on As I Lay Dying, and I will talk about these more uh, in depth. And then the other book that I... Uh, have yet to finish, but I'm gonna finish it today after I post this video, is uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, and this is the book that I'm reading for March of the Mammoths, and I do intend to finish it today. I have just under 50 pages left, and it's just magnificent, uh, really. It's just one of the most staggering achievements in literature, I think, this book is, and I can't wait to finish it. So, anyway, I'm looking forward to when I can post this video and get to back to that, and I can't wait to do a whole video on the book, so look out for that. And then I also read about 50 pages from the Oxford Anthology of African American Poetry, and that, uh, that, that is really good. I'm still finding uh, good, good poems and poets in that one. And I think that April is going to be the month when I can finally finish that book. I've been working on it for several months now, and uh, I, I only have about a hundred pages left, so I really do think I sh should be able to finish it. Anyway, that's what I read for the week, so not much book talk, but I watched a lot of films. I watched nine films this week, and I, there's no 
human way for me to talk about all of them. I've attempted to shoot this video a couple of other times and tried to talk about every single film that I watched this week. It's just not going to happen. So I'm going to list off all nine films, and if you want to know more about what I thought about any of the ones that I don't discuss in depth here, then just ask in the comments and I'm happy to chat with you about it. But so the films that I watched were uh, Cries and Whispers, directed by Ingmar Bergman, uh, The Seventh Seal, also Bergman, uh, Persona, directed by, of course, again, Bergman, uh, Light from Light, uh, directed by Paul Harrell, uh, Mouchette, directed by Robert Bresson, Brokeback Mountain, directed by Ang Lee, Yi Yi, directed by Edward Yang, uh, Booksmart, directed by Olivia Wilde, and Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, directed by David Dobkin. And so, the films that I really want to focus in on are Persona and then Booksmart and Eurovision Song Contest as sort of a pair. So I will start with Booksmart and Eurovision Song Contest. So the reason I want to talk about those in a pair is because they're both comedies and I don't tend to do very well with comedies. I have a rather morbid, dark sense of humor. The jokes that I enjoy tend to be like borderline tasteless and most film comedies don't partake in that kind of humor, and so a lot of them fall a little bit flat for me. But these two films I did really, really enjoy. So Booksmart is sort of a buddy comedy about two uh, young girls who are in their, basically their last days of high school. They're seniors in high school, they're on their last day of class, and they're two girls who've just been entirely straight edged their entire time in high school. You know, they've, they've gotten straight A's, they've done extracurriculars, they've been very diligent, and they do all this because they want to get into good colleges and, you know, obviously go on to have great careers. And they grow disillusioned on their final day of uh, school when they find out that a lot of the other kids in their high school have been just sort of partying and goofing off and so on and so forth and have also gotten into like Ivy League schools. And so they grow kind of uh, distraught and salty that, you know, they were there being so diligent and hardworking and never sort of having fun in any sort of stereotypical way uh, in terms of going to parties or anything, uh, that they decide that they are on their last day gonna just party like crazy. Uh, and so, uh, they basically try to find a party uh, to go to, and basically half the movie is just them trying to find the party, <laughs> and then the second half is kind of the fallout from that, uh, is the time when they're at the party and a sort of conflict develops between the two of them, uh, and then the rest of the movie is them sort of resolving that conflict. And uh, this was surprisingly funny. Again, a lot of the humor in comedy films doesn't tend to appealed to me a lot, but I found, especially the first half of this film, to be laugh-out-loud funny. It really was funny. Uh, has two great lead performances, I don't know the actresses' names, but th they are both great. Uh, what I like the most from Booksmart is just how sort of uh, humanistic it is toward the high school students that are in it. And what I mean by that is that I think that often when high school students are portrayed, they're often portrayed as being kind of mean to each other. Uh, you know, there are, there, there are often these cliques, uh, you know, in high schools who don't like each other very much. They're, we often see sort of bullies in high school. Uh, you know, we, we get a lot of portrayals of high school students that portray high school as, as often being rather unkind. Uh, and what I liked about this movie was that it showed high school as, as being actually relatively, like, nice to each other. <laughs> you know, no one in it is perfect. Everyone in it is can be, you know, selfish, short-sighted, immature, of course, uh, but they all ultimately mean well. And that's kind of what I like about this movie, because, you know, my experience with high school, and I was talking about this with some other people, uh, and, and they were saying the same thing, that my experience in high school was that actually most of my fellow students, even if they weren't, could, you know, made mistakes, were immature, and so on. Most of them meant well, you know, and were relatively, like, nice to me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I think that was portrayed really well in this movie. And then on top of that, just the fact that no character is perfect, but every character is, is, is portrayed with a lot of sympathy, you know? Uh, so, yeah, they all have their, their foibles, but they ultimately come out looking, um, they ultimately come out as, as sympathetic characters. And that's what I really liked, was that it's just a very humanistic uh, story. And um, 
and that it was actually funny. That was that was a great plus. And then uh, Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, directed by David Dobkin. Uh, so this uh, was a, a bit more of a mixed bag. So this stars Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams as a music duo from Iceland called Fire Saga, who want to win the Eurovision Song Contest, which I, I have no experience with the Eurovision Song Contest. I had to look up what that was when, when I encountered this movie. Uh, and they're terrible. They're a terrible group. That's kind of the point. But they somehow do end up going to the Eurovision Song Contest, and they do a terrible job. But they sort of end up having this, you know, ex inspiring experience. And I gotta say, I'm not the biggest Will Ferrell fan. I think he's kind of a ham, and I find him to be kind of vulgar. I do enjoy Elf, though, but I, I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought it was going to. I was expecting to hate it, uh, and I didn't. I actually, you know, after a while, I just realized you need to sort of lower yourself to this movie's level and just sort of enjoy it for what it is. And if you do that, then it is a lot of fun. And Rachel McAdams is really surprising in this movie. I didn't think of her as... Uh, a comic actress, but she is really good in this movie. She's really, she's quite funny. Uh, I, I want to say that I laughed out loud at this, at this movie, uh, but it's just, it's entertainment, you know what I mean? And one thing I will also say about it, on a bit more of a negative note, is that it, I, going into this film, I expected the music to be, like, the only aspect of it that I actually liked. Uh, and in fact, the music in this movie was terrible. All of it was terrible. I... Well, here no ifs, ands, or buts in the matter. The music is horrible. So, that was odd, you know, to go into a, a movie which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Song and to have the music be the worst part. But anyway, so, again, it's on Netflix, so, and then Booksmart is on Hulu, so if you're interested, they're there. And then I want to talk about Persona. And... Persona is uh, such a, a fascinating film, you know, this is my second time watching it, and the first time I watched it I really liked it, but also knew that there was a lot in it that I just didn't, didn't crack, and there's a lot in this viewing that I know I did not crack, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that subsequent viewings will not, you know, make, give me a perfect understanding. I don't think anyone has a perfect understanding of this film. But there are uh, two things I want to talk about with this film, because there's been so much that's been said about the film that if I tried to say anything halfway intelligent about it, I think I would just come off as a bit of a fool. You know, I was reading the Wikipedia page for the movie, and someone has said of the film, and I agree with them, that basically anything you could say about the film could be contradicted. You know, any sort of point of analysis that you make, and so on and so forth, could be contradicted. And I, I agree, because it's a very enigmatic, paradoxical, contradictory film, but, you know, it has two magnificent performances by Liv Ullman and B.B. Anderson, and insanely interesting cinematography. You know, it's one of those movies where it, it presents itself as a film self-consciously to you, which I think is extremely interesting. I think, in a sense, the relationship between B.B. Anderson's character and Liv Ullman's character is a little bit like, a little bit analogous to the relationship between a film and the viewer. Because uh, for those who don't know the story of Persona, it, it's, it's so B.B. Anderson is a, nur as a nurse named Alma who is assigned to take care of an actress, a famous actress na who named Mrs. Vogler, who has stopped talking. Completely mentally and physically healthy, she's just stopped talking. And so basically the film is a series of conversations between one person, even though there are two people in the frame. You know, B.B. Anderson's character just talking and talking and talking to Liv Ullman's character and never getting a response. And it seems to me that that's sort of the relationship between a film and its audience, right? And that's, that's an extremely interesting uh, idea. And, you know, at one point there's a little bit of narration in the film. And the narration is done by Ingmar Bergman himself, you know? And uh, there, there are also other points that sort of draw attention to the fact that it's a film, you see the celluloid sort of break up at one point, and, and so on and so forth. So, anyway, th there's a lot I could say uh, about this film. But, two points that I want to make about it. One, is that I think that Ingmar Bergman, of all directors I've encountered, uh, might be the only one who's turned opening credits into a work of art on their own. Because the opening credits to this movie are just nuts. I just love the opening credits. You know, you'll see, you'll see a name on a white background, and then in between that name and the next name, 
Uh, there will be a flash of an image, and it's often this boy who appears in the prologue. Sometimes it's something else, like lips that are turned on their side, so they look a lot more suggestive. And then, of course, there's that insane uh, prologue as well, which is almost like a like an operatic overture, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, and, and I was noticing that in Cries and Whispers as well, which I rewatched this week, uh, where the uh, opening credits for that film are also extremely uh, ev evocative. Uh, and and the second thing that I want to say that I think is interesting, and I haven't, I haven't done too much research, but I haven't heard anyone talk about this possibility. But I started to think while watching this movie that Persona could be a science fiction film, and I thought that was such an interesting possibility because you know I think of science fiction stories, whether they're film or books, as basically being thought experiments. You know about you know if this happened, if this plausible, vaguely plausible thing happened, how would that affect us? You know, whether it's technology, encountering extraterrestrials, um, natural disaster, whatever. How would this vaguely plausible thing happening affect us, affect a human being? And it seems like in Persona, what that thought experiment is, is if you were told to form a relationship with someone who didn't talk who didn't communicate, because Liv Ullman's character doesn't just not talk, she doesn't even use body language all that much. Although, interestingly, she does write letters, which I always think is super interesting, that she won't talk, but she will write letters. So I've always wondered why B.B. Anderson's character didn't just ask her to write her things uh, instead of trying to talk to her, if she really wanted to communicate with her. But anyway, if you were told to form a relationship with someone who did not talk, who would not talk to you, how would that affect you? You know, what would happen to you? You know, as you as you tried to get tried to get something out of them. And you know, for B.B. Anderson's character, it seems like she slowly forgets that she is a separate person from Liv Ullman's character. You know, and anyway, I just think that I the it intrigued me the possibility of Persona as a as a as a as a science fiction film, uh, because there are shots in it that are evocative of a science fiction film that are almost sort of surreal in a way that wouldn't be out of place in you know something by David Lynch or from Blade Runner or something else and there's even a shot in the film that I think might be directly referenced in Blade Runner there's a shot where someone's where a man's hand is being uh, nailed onto a cross uh, you know so and his, his uh, hand is sort of curling up like this and there's a shot just like that in Blade Runner, where someone's, where uh, one of the replicants sticks a nail through his palm, and uh, his his palm, his hand is sort of curling up like this. So I just thought that was an intriguing possibility. I don't know what to do with that or where that would lead, but I think it's an interesting idea to explore. So anyway, so I just wanted to say that uh, the other films that I watched again, I can't watch, talk about all of them. I will touch on Yi Yi at the end, directed by Edward Yang. Edward Yang is a new director to me. I watched his film The Terrorizers earlier this year. This is my second of his films. I also want to watch Taipei Story, which I think I will do today. And so I think I may talk a bit more about Edward Yang next week. I will try to. So I will talk about that. I really loved Yi Yi. I will just say preliminarily, I loved it. Uh, and then Brokeback Mountain is an old favorite of mine, and I just needed a rewatch, and I rewatched it. So anyway, but. Anyway, if you want any more, more of my thoughts on any of the movies I didn't talk about, let me know. But I will leave it at that. Hope you all enjoyed. If you have thoughts on anything, let me know. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.